Well, hello, Crossroads family. I want to get going this weekend by asking you, what type of person are you? Like when you go to assemble something, are you one of those people who read all the directions or do you just chuck the instructions and just get to work? Or maybe if you're going to make something in the kitchen, do you use a recipe or do you just start throwing things into a bowl and see what happens? Well, I'm not very handy in the kitchen or around the house. And so what that means is I'm dependent on Google. I like to Google things and say like, okay, what are the instructions for me to fix the car or to build something in the backyard? When I go to assemble something, I always use the instructions. I'm, I'm dependent on following those detailed instructions. Sometimes you have to know all the terminology and there's always a good recommendation to follow the steps in order. I remember the first project I did around the house. It was way before Google. I wanted to install a pull down staircase for our attic that was out on the carport. And so I didn't follow the instructions. I just went to the store and bought the product. And when I got home, the first thing I missed that it said all over the box was, this is a two man project. I just shoved the box up in the attic. I used a ladder to get up there and I started putting that thing in place. And what I soon found out is that there was no way I could get out of the attic. The staircase was installed properly. I just couldn't get it to fold down so I could get out of the attic. So I began banging on the roof to try to get my wife's attention. And then right after that, what I realized is that I didn't measure from the floor to the top of the attic. And so my ladder was about a foot short of even touching the ground. I had to build a platform so that my ladder would actually work. It was a mismal failure. I want to start right now just with a discussion question. I'd like for you to share with your family or with those that you're gathered with right now. Share a time when you tried to cook something or assemble something and be honest. Do you did you follow the instructions or not? And how did that work out for you? Discuss that for a few moments. walking through the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. If you have a Bible, I'd encourage you to turn there with me. Jesus has just fed a multitude miraculously. He's walked on the water and he's been teaching about his true identity as the eternal source of life. Uh, many have seen this as a prominent moment in the life of Jesus in his public ministry. And many people think it was kind of a dividing moment, like a, land in, a line in the sand for his followers. Jesus has just finished this lengthy discourse uh, where he described himself as living bread, bread from heaven, the bread of life. His point is very clear. He says, I am the source of life. True life is found only in me. He speaks of eating his flesh and drinking his blood just as a strong metaphor to stress this reality that feeding on Jesus is the only way to have eternal life. Now, this isn't a new message from the Gospel of John. We've been seeing it from the very beginning. In John chapter 1, verse 4, it says that in Jesus was life, and that life was the light of mankind. In John 3, verses 15 and 16, it says, Everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his on and only Son, and whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. 
John 4 verse 14 says, whoever drinks the water that I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And in John 5 verse 24, Jesus says, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He will not be judged, but is crossed over from death to life. Jesus has been deconstructing the misconception about his identity. He used many Old Testament references or analogies and metaphors to communicate his message as well as his true identity. And now in verses 60 through 71, John records three different responses that we want to look at today and identify how you and I should respond to the same clear message that Jesus is the only way. Look at verse 60 of chapter six. It says this, on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. The message translation makes a little play on words referring to the eating and drinking that Jesus has just been speaking of. And it says that Jesus' words were too tough to swallow. Let's continue reading now in verse 61 of chapter six. It says, aware that Jesus' disciples were grumbling about this, he said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you see the son of man ascend to where he was before? The spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you, they are full of the spirit and life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the father has enabled them. The it in verse 60 and the this in verse 61 is actually Jesus' strong declaration about his identity and his sufficiency. In verse 40, he said this, everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life. It wasn't that what Jesus said was difficult to understand, but it was difficult to accept. He doesn't recant or retract his statement, but he continues to speak more clearly by saying, if this offends you, just wait till you see the son of man ascending to where he was before. Now, this ascending is actually a reference to his upcoming crucifixion. The original language actually parallels Jesus' statement to Nicodemus in chapter three, when he talks about the son of man being lifted up on a pole like like the snake was in the desert. This ascending is also a reference to his origin from heaven. And Jesus is saying this, if you were disappointed that I'm not the king you wanted me to be, Or if you're disappointed that the bread I fed you has ran out, you're going to be really disappointed when you see me arrested and crucified. The people, uh, they had to struggle with this. And, And Jesus was presenting that when they saw him crucified, that would be scandalous. Jesus continually referred to him coming from heaven to speak of his oneness with God and his role as Messiah. And he often uses the title for himself, Son of Man. We see this title after Jesus has died and ascended back to heaven in Acts chapter seven. Stephen was one of the first martyrs for his followership of Jesus. And as he was being stoned and dying, Luke records this in Acts chapter seven, verse 55 and 66. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the son of man standing at the right hand of God. That's where Jesus came from and that's where he returned to. In verse 63, Jesus then repeats the same declaration that he had said to Nicodemus and the promise that he had been offering to everyone. He says, my words are from the Holy Spirit and they bring life. In the epistle that John writes later, 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, he describes Jesus as the word of life. One of the clearest characteristics of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament is that it was giving life to all. And Jesus has continually indicated and demonstrated that the work of the Holy Spirit is in him and through him. And he would, he would give this, uh, this life to all who accepted his teaching and chose to follow him. We will learn more about the role of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 14. Jesus was challenging the common thinking that ancestry or moral behavior or obedience to the law would give a person the right standing before God and achieve for them life to the fullest, even eternal life. He refuted this by saying that it is only through the Spirit that we can have life. 
Paul compares living by the flesh and living by the spirit in Romans chapter seven, verse eight. And Jesus says that the flesh is really not worth anything. It's the spirit who gives life. I'd encourage you to take some time to read Romans seven and eight and listen to how Paul describes and compares living by either. We see in this moment the the first response to Jesus' words. It's the crowds. They decide to turn away. See, this was a hard teaching to accept. And they got choked on what he was saying and decided to to turn back. F.F. Bruce says this, what they wanted, he would not give. What he offered, they would not receive. In verse 66, John says this, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. This verse is probably better stated, for this reason, many turned back. Now it's clear that the disciples John's referring to is not the 12, it's those who followed Jesus only interested in the miracles and the benefits. N.T. Wright says this, he had made a huge hole in their worldview and they preferred not to think about it anymore. Jesus is revealing his character. And over the past several weeks, we've looked at several statements that Jesus makes about himself that scripture points to about Jesus, that Jesus is life, that he's provider, that he's present, that he's enough. I'd like for you to wrestle with that for just a few moments in the groups that you're gathered in. I'd like you to discuss this question openly, if you're willing. What has been a difficult truth about Jesus to accept? And why is that? Share that with each other right now. I certainly hope as we are going through the gospel of John that your view of Jesus keeps getting bigger and bigger. I hope that you're using your journal to write down the things that you're learning about Jesus. And I I hope that you'll continue to wrestle with those things. You might go back and even look at some of the previous messages. You can find those at media.cccgo.com. You know, Jesus was not overwhelmed by the loss of commitment on the part of the many who had professed some allegiance to him, nor was he shocked. John stated in verse 64 that Jesus knew from the beginning which of them did not believe. He had also made a similar statement in John 2, verse 25. Jesus, as fully God, is fully omniscient. He knew the state of people's heart and he wasn't shocked or was even thwarted in fulfilling God's mission to bring life to all who do believe in him. Listen to what he says to the 12 disciples next in verse 67. He says, Jesus asked the 12, You do not want to leave too, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We've come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. We see in this the second response to Jesus' invitation. It's Peter proclaiming the truth. Peter seems to be the self-appointed spokesman for the others and typically has more wrestling to do with what Jesus has just said. But he speaks confidently in this moment of what he and the others have come to understand and believe that Jesus is the only way. And Peter claims that that Jesus is the source of eternal life. He also makes it clear that Jesus' words are true. 
I don't know about you, but one of the most disarming things and and frustrating things about the COVID-19 situation has been who to listen to. I mean, it began by saying that you shouldn't wear a mask. Now it's saying everybody should wear a mask. There was a a possible solution through a medication. Now they've debunked that and said it's not true. They immediately thought that the best uh, care was to put people on respirators. Now they're not sure that's right. And then there's all of the the cynical views about this and all the conspiracy theories. I mean, who are we supposed to listen to? Well, I find comfort in, in what... Peter says about Jesus' words, they may be challenging, but they are trustworthy. And also Peter says that Jesus is the Holy One of God. The Old Testament used a name for God, the Holy One of Israel. And Peter's connecting these two ideas that Jesus is one with God. It speaks to his deity. And it also speaks that he's set apart, he's appointed by God to do his work. In John 17, verse 19, Jesus says, I've been sanctified or or set apart so that I can sanctify others. This declaration by Peter seems similar to the the other three gospels recording of Peter making the great confession. Matthew 16 and Mark 8 and Luke 9 all record Peter making this statement about Jesus. It's the same saving faith through believing in who Jesus is, proclaiming his deity, his power, his authority. And I think it's truly the line of demarcation for Christianity. If you believe that there's any other way to be saved, you probably find Jesus' words hard to swallow. It's a claim of sufficiency, of supremacy, and certainly exclusivity. Jesus is the only way. If you're trying to be good enough, you won't. If you're trying to ride the coattails of faith of your spouse or even your parents, you can't. If you think that just showing up for a worship service is is what it's all about, it's not. And if you think that you're not worthy to follow Jesus, you're wrong. You were created to have a relationship with God. You need to listen closely and truly process what Jesus is saying, what he's offering. It's certainly exclusive and challenging, but how we respond makes all the difference. Do you see how the masses responded compared to how Peter responded and how the disciples responded? Those who turned away understood that being a follower of Jesus involves steadfast allegiance to him. You must accept his claims of deity and that he is the only source of eternal life. They turned away and and decided to reject his demands. They were willing to accept the free meals, but they were not interested in submitting to the lordship of Jesus. They maintained their their, their integrity, but they missed out on life to the fullest and eternal life in the days to come. Peter, though, he understood the cost of believing in Jesus. Remember, he and the others had left everything to follow Jesus, their family, their profession their professions, their security, their comfort, even their reputation. Peter knew that there was no one else except Jesus that brings eternal life. And he understood and believed Jesus is the Messiah, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the living water, the bread of life, the Holy One of God, the one who brings eternal life. Peter knew that Jesus is the only way. It could be this same moment where Peter makes the great confession that Jesus explains the the cost of following him. Luke records that after Jesus fed the 5,000, Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter in that moment says, you are God's Messiah. And then Jesus follows up that statement in Luke chapter nine, verse 23 and says this, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself, take up his cross and daily follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet lose or forfeit their very self? The cost of following Jesus is great, but finding life to the fullest now and eternal life in Jesus forever is greater. But we can't ignore that the fact that Jesus clearly knows Not everyone is willing to pay this cost. And that's where we see a third response. It's Judas and he falls away. Listen what happens in verse 70 of John 6. Jesus replied, have I not chosen you the 12? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who though one of the 12 was later to betray him. Every mention of the 12 disciples in the four gospels mentions Judas and also refers to him as the one who will betray Jesus. 
There was actually another disciple named Judas. He was the son of James, but he chose to go by Thaddeus. If my name was Judas, I'd go by something else too. I wouldn't want to be mistaken as the person who was going to betray Jesus, would you? I mean, Jesus, fully God and all knowing, knew from the very beginning, before inviting him to be one of the 12, that Judas would betray him. And it begs the question, why, knowing this, would Jesus invite Judas to be one of the 12? Well, it's because Judas wasn't in control. God was. It wasn't Judas's plan that led to Jesus being crucified. It was God's love and his desire for everyone to have eternal life by believing in Jesus. The cross was necessary to accomplish God's mission. It's very clear from scripture that Satan entered Judas to try to accuse, even slander Jesus. In fact, Jesus in this moment in John 6 calls Judas the devil, not a devil. It, it, the original word means adversary. Satan found a foothold in Judas and that led him toward destruction. And he wants to do the same for each and every one of us so that we won't find life to the fullest in Jesus. John 10 verse 10, Jesus says, the thief comes to kill, steal and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and life to the full. Knowing that, that's why Peter says in 1 Peter 5 verse 8 and 9, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. So resist him, standing firm in the faith. To be, be a follower of Jesus means to accept his claims of deity and to trust him as the only way for salvation and eternal life. We resist the devil by standing firm in our belief in who Jesus is. Belief is not just a mental exercise or just an allegiance of the heart. It's a matter of control. We reorient our entire life around Jesus as Lord over everything. The late Adrian Rogers tells about a time where he met a Romanian pastor. His name was Joseph Tsum. And Joseph talked about uh, what commitment was like in the American uh, Christianity, or the version of Christianity. And so Adrian Rogers asked him to kind of unpack that. And so with some reluctance, Joseph said this. The key word in American Christianity is commitment. In Romania, we don't even have a word to translate that English word commitment. If you were to use the commitment in a message, Adrian, I would not have a pro proper word to translate it with. And Yosef continued, when a new word comes into usage, it generally pushes out an old world. And so I began to study and found what old world that commitment replaced. That word is surrender. So Adrian Rogers asked Yosef, he says, what's the difference between commitment and surrender? And Yosef said this, when you make a commitment, you are still in control, no matter how noble the things that you're committing to is. One could commit to praying or to studying the Bible, to give money, or even to commit to automobile payments or even to lose weight. Whatever he chooses to do, he commits to it. But surrender is different, Yosef said. If someone holds a gun to you and asks you to lift your hands in the air as an act of surrender, you don't tell that person what you're committed to. You just do what you're told. It's an act of surrender. He said, Americans love commitment because they're still in control. But the key word to following Jesus is surrender. We are slaves to the Lord Jesus Christ. Steve Smith in his book, Spirit Walk, makes a comment after hearing this story. He says, commitment can be self-centered and cause-centered. Commitment is fundamentally about me. How strongly am I devoted to someone or something? But surrender is all about the other person. I relinquish my rights and give up control for someone or something else. And he says this, our churches are filled with nominally committed churchgoers who have prayed a prayer and show up at services occasionally. And maybe there's scattered among them a few committed Christians who show up regularly in earnest faith and do most of the work. But how many surrendered disciples do we have? Disciples completely sold out to Jesus and his agenda for their lives. Commitment's not a bad thing, except when it gets in the way of surrender. You know, what separated Peter from Judas and the crowds was that Peter was surrendered. Everybody else wanted a lot of things from Jesus. And when he demanded absolute authority, they choked and split. They wanted fulfillment, not surrender. So where do you find yourself today? 
I mean, have you seen some of the miracles that Jesus has done for others and wonder if he could help maybe uh, help you overcome your addiction or maybe bring peace to your marriage or, or straighten out your finances or give you wisdom as a parent or just make some peace of the world around you? Maybe you found yourself in a crowd of people who, who seem to be listening to Jesus' words. They, they talk about how wonderful he is, but you find yourself debating if it's really worth giving up complete control of your life. That sounds like a really tall order to choose him over everything else, even yourself, even though his offer seems really authentic. Or maybe you've been hanging around Jesus for quite some time now. You attend worship services, you read the Bible, you pray, you even serve but it still has been a wrestling match between you and him for control of your life. It's been on your terms and you can be easily disappointed, even grow cynical when things don't turn out the way that you want or play out like you wish. Peter's confession is a declaration of surrender. Jesus is the only way. Peter knew that he was a sinner and couldn't save himself. Peter knew that he had seen firsthand the demonstration of deity in Jesus and he was a firm believer and he relinquished control of his life and entrusted everything to Jesus as Savior and Lord. Belief must be surrender, recognizing Jesus as the only way. And I hope you will choose surrender today. Leslie Newbegin says this, to believe is to have been brought to the place where one knows that one all has to rely completely on Jesus and on Jesus alone. We mentioned earlier in our service that we're entering into these 40 days of fasting and prayer. And we're asking God, would you bring clarity about our next steps of living and loving like Jesus as an individual, as a family, and as your church? And I want you to know that it's a posture of surrender that we're taking. We're opening our hearts and our hands and our minds to what God wants to do in our lives individually in our families and collectively as his church. And I hope that you'll join in with us in this posture of surrender. You know, if you're tired of looking everywhere else at anything else or even yourself as the source of life, I hope you hear Jesus' clear offer today and accept him as the only savior and Lord of your life. He offers you life to the fullest now and eternal life when this life is over. And Peter's confession and example is one to follow and repeat. He surrendered his life to Jesus. He learned how to live and love like him. And he was saved and satisfied. And we know that because Peter wrote a book. He talks about what he found in Jesus. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead uh, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in this last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. These have come so that you, the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even when refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you're receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. In verse 18, Peter says this, you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. If you're ready to accept Jesus' offer of salvation and the gift of eternal life, I want you to pick up your phone right now and text the word now to 812-858-8668. We are friends who are, who are ready and prepared to help you accept Jesus' offer of Savior and Lord and help take your next steps in following him right now. Anyone may have eternal life if they receive Jesus, trust in him as the only foundation for salvation. They surrender to his lordship and they are satisfied with all that God is in Jesus. 
We've been praying for you to respond and I pray that you'll surrender your life to Jesus right now. For those of us who have already surrendered our lives to Jesus as Savior and Lord, I wanna invite you to celebrate the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus through a time of communion. You know, we declare in this act our surrendered lives to Jesus, that he is the source of our salvation, strength, hope, and peace. And we declare our dependence on him and our satisfaction in him. We are surrendered to him. So wherever you are worshiping today and whomever you may be gathered with today, I pray that you'll take the time right now to thank God for sending Jesus as the only way and thank him for the eternal life that you can find in Jesus alone. Let's pray together. God, thank you for sending Jesus as the only way for us to find salvation and to find eternal life. And God, it's a tall order to surrender our lives to Jesus, but there is no other person, there is no other way to find peace with you, to find joy and satisfaction in life and in you. And God, there is no other way that we can find eternal life. We can't earn it on our own. Someone else can't give it to us. We can't do it by good behavior. There's no other way to find this eternal life than to embrace who Jesus is and surrender our life to him. And God, I pray for every person who might be considering that right now, that they'd find the courage to say yes. They'd find the courage to to offer their life back to you as a sacrifice, as an offering. And that God, just like you have in my life, you would show yourself to be God. You would take away the guilt that we feel because of our past sins. God, you would restore in us joy. God, that you would cement our relationship in you through the power of your Holy Spirit. And that, God, we would enjoy life to the fullest now and that we would hold on to the promise of eternal life when this life is over. And God, in this moment right now, we celebrate Jesus' life, his death and resurrection by remembering his body that was broken for us, that he surrendered himself to you as an example for us to follow. And that his blood purifies us from all unrighteousness. It heals us from the inside out. And we find peace and hope and joy in Jesus. And it's through him we pray right now. Amen.